welcome to lesson number five for our series, How's Your Health? Diagnosing and Developing Your Spiritual Health. If you've been with us, you know that we're asking multiple diagnostic questions to help us diagnose our spiritual health so then we can develop or improve our spiritual health. We've asked several questions thus far. Today's question is, are you more sensitive to God's presence. Are you more sensitive to God's presence? Let me ask you this. Have you ever found yourself maybe in a crowded room or a place where there's a lot of people and you felt somebody was staring at you? Have you ever experienced that? You just kind of feel like someone is there. You feel like someone's watching. It's kind of creepy, right? Especially if you turn around and you see somebody staring at you. It kind of creeps you out, right? Uh, it's almost like you felt their presence. Well, hopefully we don't get creeped out when we feel God's presence. But today we want to ask the question, are you aware, are you more sensitive to God's presence? Now, I hopefully, I hope we are all aware of the Great Commission. The Great Commission Jesus gave us in Matthew chapter 28. Uh, and in Matthew chapter 28, verse the end of verse 20, after Jesus gives us the Great Commission, where he says, you know, go into all the world, make disciples. At the end of verse 20, Jesus says this. He says, And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. So Jesus promises to be with us always. However, many Christians report never experiencing the presence of God. Uh, for instance, a survey was conducted by George Barna. And George Barna found that 32% of professing Christian, Christians claim they have never felt God's presence. 32% of professing Christians have never felt God's presence. And while 68% claim that they have felt his presence at some time in their lives, I'm going to be honest with you, that's not very reassuring. 68% they have said they have felt God's presence at some time. But that's not what Jesus said at the end of the Great Commission. He didn't say, you'll feel, you'll, you'll, I will be with you sometimes. No, he said, I will be with you always. Uh, of the, that 68% that claim to have felt God's presence at some time, 13% of them admit that they have only felt his presence one or two times in their life. If you ask me, that's not what Jesus is talking about, okay? When Jesus says, I will be with you always, he doesn't mean I'll be with you sometimes. I'll be with you once or twice. He means, I will be with you always. So, how often are you aware of God's presence? And when you're aware of that presence, what are you doing? Have you ever thought about that? Where are you or what are you doing when you're aware of the presence of God? As believers, as Christians, as followers of Jesus Christ, when Jesus Christ says, I will be with you always, we should be aware of his presence more than once or twice in our life. And why? Why is that so important? Why is it so important to be aware of the presence of God? The writer of Proverbs tells us this in Proverbs 15, verse 3. The writer of Proverbs says, The eyes of the Lord are in every place keeping watch on the evil and the good. The eyes of the Lord are in every place, keeping watch on the evil and the good. Commenting on this verse, Old Testament scholar uh, W. Gunther Plott says, The verse is not meant as a statement of theology, but an incentive for conduct. It's an incentive for conduct. In other words, the point of that proverb is to say, God's watching you, right? Uh, Whitney adds, insensitivity to the nearness of God certainly means less awareness that the eyes of the Lord are in every place, keeping watch on the evil and the good. That leads to thinking less of restraining sin on the one hand or of doing good on the other. Simply put, being aware of God's presence is an aid in godly living. Now, maybe that's not what you want. But I would hope that if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, that's exactly what you want. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, I hope what you want 
is godly living. You want to obey the Lord. You want to live for the Lord. Okay? And if that is what you want, being aware of God's presence is a tremendous aid for that purpose. Being aware that God is always watching me hopefully will inspire me and encourage me to turn away from sin, which is what I want, and to obey Him, which again is what I want. To put things in perspective, if you have children, when are your children more likely to get in trouble? While you're watching them or when you turn your back? If they're anything like my kids, my kids are much more likely to get in trouble when I'm not looking. And it's the same way with God. When we realize that God is always watching, when we are aware of God's presence, that will help us and that will encourage us to live for Him. And again, I hope that's exactly what we want. Before we go any further, though, we really do need to talk about what do we mean by the presence of God. So we're asking, are you more aware of the presence of God? But what do we mean by the presence of God? You see, the presence of God can refer to several different things. For instance, the presence of God can refer to the universal presence of God. God is everywhere. Okay, God is omnipresent. That means God is everywhere all the time. Regardless of the way you feel, God is present. God is always around. Um, and we read about this, for instance, the prophet Jeremiah, in the book of Jeremiah, the Lord says in Jeremiah 23, 24, Can a man hide himself in secret places so that I cannot see him, declares the Lord? Do I not feel heaven and earth? declares the Lord. Now, those are rhetorical questions. The answer to those questions are, no, we can't hide from God. And yes, God, you do feel heaven and earth. God's everywhere all the time. That is the universal presence of God. However, the presence of God can also refer to the Christological presence of God. Now, this refers to one specific time in history when God became flesh and dwelt among us. Again, we read about this in the Gospel of John, John chapter 1, verse 14. I'm just going to read it on my computer. John chapter 1, verse 14, the Scripture says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. So the Christological presence of God refers to that time in history when Jesus Christ came to earth, Emmanuel, God with us. There is also the perceptible presence of God. This is when God's presence is perceived through his work or his influence. This is when something happens and we think to ourselves, God must have been in this. God must have done this. God must have been responsible for this. Maybe you didn't feel his presence at the time, but the results let you know that God was involved. If you look in the New Testament, we find this, for example, in Acts chapter 11, verse 21. In Acts chapter 11, verse 21, we're reading about the church in Antioch. And the scripture says, And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number who believed turned to the Lord. So church in Antioch sees great growth as people believe in Jesus Christ. Whether they felt it or not, they know that the results are because of God's presence. Fourth, there is the heavenly presence of God. Now, the heavenly presence of God refers to the fact that God is currently on his throne in heaven, where we will one day go to him and spend all of eternity there. So when Jesus teaches us to pray in Matthew chapter 6, verse 9, Jesus says this in Matthew 6, 9, Pray then like this, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. So God is currently in heaven. Finally, another way, uh, another thing that we refer to when we talk about the, the presence of God, and this is really what we're going to be talking about today, the indwelling presence of God. When we talk about the indwelling presence of God, this is what we're referring to when we talk about the presence of God. You see, God is present in a very special way with Christians because the Holy Spirit is living inside of us. The indwelt presence. The presence of God is dwelling inside of me as a Christian. And that's not true for non-Christians. That's only true for Christians. 
And we read about this in John chapter 14. Uh, John chapter 14, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn there if you want to turn there with me. John 14, verses 16 and 17. John 14, verses 16 and 17, the scripture says, And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive. You see that? Who the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. Pay attention to that verse. He, speaking of the Holy Spirit, he dwells with you and will be in you. If you're a Christian, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit dwells in you all the time. This is what Jesus was talking about in the Great Commission where he says, I will be with you always. He will be with you always because the Holy Spirit is dwelling inside of you. And that is not true for Christian, for non-Christians. Excuse me. That is not true for non-Christians. If someone is not a believer, they cannot say, well, I feel the presence of God in me. They don't. Okay? Only believers, only followers of Jesus Christ have the Holy Spirit living inside of them and can feel and be aware of the indwelt presence of God. However, that begs the question, if God is always with us as believers, why do we feel him sometimes, but we don't feel him other times? There's a kind of a couple things, several things going on here. First, we need to understand that while we do have emotions, we were created by God with emotions, our relationship with God is not purely emotional. Okay? We cannot always trust how we feel. All right? We live in a fallen, sinful world, and there are a lot of things that affect our emotions. Okay? What I eat affects my emotions. How much sleep I get affects my emotions. So if I eat a bad burrito and don't get a lot of sleep, I may not feel the presence of God. That doesn't mean he's left me. That just means that, you know, I've got emotional issues going on, okay? Because we're emotional creatures. So we live by faith, not by feeling. As Christians, we live by faith, not by feeling. We believe that Jesus Christ said he will be with us always and we can trust him. And therefore, no matter how I feel, I live by faith knowing that he will be with me. Secondly, we must also accept responsibility for our actions. We cannot expect to feel close to God when we are focusing on the world more than we are God. When we're focusing on this material world and the things of this world, and we're not focusing on the Lord, we can't expect to feel really close to Him. If we want to be aware of God's presence, we need to prioritize the things of God so that we can experience His presence. We need to put more emphasis on the eternal and less emphasis on the temporal. If we do that, we'll be more aware of His presence. Thirdly, while He is always with us, the truth is we're not going to feel His presence necessarily if we're actively living in disobedience. If you're living in disobedience, if you're not obeying the Lord, you're not going to feel very close to the Lord. We experience that all the time in our personal human relationships. When we wrong someone or someone has wronged us, we don't necessarily feel close to them. There's a wall there, right? We talk about it, it feels like there's a wall between us. Well, it's the same thing in our relationship with the Lord. He never leaves us. But we may not feel close to him if we're disobeying him, if, we, if we're doing something we know we shouldn't, or if we're not doing something we know we should. We may not feel close to the Lord, and so we need to own that. We need to confess our sins, ask for forgiveness, return to his presence. All of those things can, can affect the way we feel. Finally, we must also recognize that, and we talked about this some in a previous lesson, there will be times when God purposely and intentionally removes his felt presence. Now, please listen to me. I said he removes his felt presence, and he does that to strengthen our faith. This does not mean he leaves. This does not mean God is gone. What I mean is he removes his felt presence. He's still there, but he may not allow you to feel him. Why would he do that? Because he wants you to live by faith, and not by feeling. 
Sometimes God wants us to grow. Not all the time God wants us to grow. But sometimes to help us grow, to help us strengthen our faith, he may remove his felt presence. So what do we do when we don't feel him? We live by faith. We seek him out. This may have been exactly how the psalmist felt in Psalm 22 when the psalmist writes in Psalm 22, 1 and 2, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me? From the words of my groaning. Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer. And by night, but I find no rest. Did God forsake David? No, of course not. But it felt that way to David. David wasn't feeling the felt presence of God. So what did he do? He lived by faith. And I encourage you, go back and keep reading Psalm 22. It's a great psalm. Keep reading Psalm 22. Psalm 22, David talks about, God, I can't feel you, but I trust you. God, I don't feel your presence, but I know you're there. He lives by faith, and he comes out the other end stronger. So sometimes, through no fault of our own, God is going to remove his felt presence so that we live by faith, so that we seek him out, so that, we, so that it increases that desire for him. Remember a few weeks ago we talked about our desire for God? Sometimes God will remove his felt presence to increase our desire for him so that we seek him all the more diligently. Back to our original question. Are you more sensitive to God's presence? If the answer is no, I'm not more sensitive to God's presence, how do we change that? How do we develop our spiritual health? How do we uh, become more aware of God's presence? Well, first and foremost, we spend time in His Word. Okay, This, and it may sound obvious, but and we say this a lot, you know, pretty much every question we're going to ask, we're going to say go back to the Bible, but it's just that important. Okay, This is where we find God. This is God's word to us. If we want to experience and feel the presence of God, we need to get in his word. We need to read what he has told us. We need to study the Bible, pray over scripture, meditate on scripture. Okay, This is where we're going to find him, and nine times out of ten, this is where we're going to feel him. Remember earlier I asked you, what were you doing those times when you failed to feel the presence of God? Most of the time it's when we're reading scripture. It's when we're meditating on Scripture. It's when we're listening to a sermon or a Bible study or music that's based off of God's Word. That's when we feel His presence. Why? Because He uses His Word. That's how He communicates to Him. See, sadly, we currently live in a day when New Age theology is popular. Mysticism is popular. And therefore, we need to learn to recognize what is God's presence and what is not God's presence. Because sometimes Satan's just trying to play tricks on us. Satan's trying to fool us. You may hear people say, well, my God is this. Or to me, God is this. Let me tell you something. Let me give you some advice. If you ever hear somebody say that, run away from them as fast as you can. Okay? Because my God is not different than your God because there is only one God. God will never reveal himself to you in a way that is contrary to Scripture. Let me say that again. God will never reveal himself to you in a way contrary to Scripture. That's very popular now. People are trying to change the Bible and talk about God is this and God is that and God has changed his mind. No, he hasn't. If you feel a certain way and if it's contrary to God's word, it's not of God and you need to run away. The writer of Hebrews tells us just this. In Hebrews chapter 3, verse 8, the writer of Hebrews says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. You see, I can't say my God is if I mean something different than your God is or his God is or her God is. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So if you ever feel a certain way and it's contrary to Scripture, you know what you feel is not God. It's Satan. Whitney reminds us when he says this. He says, we must base our experience with God upon the Word of God. We must base our experience with God upon the Word of God. 
So the first thing we do is we get into the Word of God. If you want to feel the presence of God, get into God's Word. Read it, study it, meditate on it. The second thing, talk to God. Again, I know this sounds familiar, but if you want to experience the presence of God, try talking to God. The more you ignore God, the more distant God will seem. Okay, I can live in the same house with my wife, but if I don't talk to her, I'm going to feel separated from her, even if I'm not. It's no different with God. If I'm not talking to him, I'm not going to feel his presence. So get in the word and start talking to him. In fact, the best thing to do is number one and number two combined. All right, Get in the word, read the word, meditate on the word, study the word, and then pray. Pray as you read the word. Another way to experience the presence of God is worship him in community. Worship him in community. The scripture tells us that we were created to live in community. So find a local church, find some believers, and worship him. It's amazing when you are in the house of God, with the people of God, studying the word of God, you often feel the presence of God. It's funny how that works, isn't it? Last thing I'd advise you to do is look for him in everyday situations. You ever played the game Punch Bug? You know when you see the Volkswagen Beetles and you punch people? Every time you see one, you know, you, I, at least I've noticed, the more I play that game, the more I see him, the more, the I, I'm sorry, let me start all over. <laughs> when you play that game, when you start looking for them, you start seeing them more. That's what I was trying to say. The more you look for something, the more often you see it. It's interesting, the more we look for God, the more we find him. The more we look for God in everyday situations, the more we'll find God in everyday situations. So I encourage you to consciously, actively look for God. You'll be surprised how often you find him. That's all the time we have for this one. Uh, so let's go ahead and wrap up now. And Next week we're going to ask the question, do you have a growing concern for the spiritual and temporal needs of others? Do you have a growing concern for the spiritual and temporal needs of others? Some passages of Scripture you may want to read. Mark chapter 6, verse 30 through 44. Acts chapter 2, verses 44 and 45. Galatians 2, verses 9 and 10. James 2, verses... I just read that whole chapter there. James is good. Read that whole chapter 2. Some questions you want to consider. What is the greatest need in the world today? You ever ask yourself that? You ever thought about that? What is the greatest need in the world today? Another question to ask is, is it possible to meet a spiritual need while ignoring a physical need? Sometimes we meet people and they have both spiritual needs and physical needs. Is it possible to meet a spiritual need while ignoring a physical need? Knowing we can't meet all the needs in the world, how do we choose? How do we choose which needs we meet and when we meet them? And how do I become more sensitive to the needs of others? If I'm not sensitive to others' needs, how do I increase that sensitivity? Those are all questions we're going to ask and answer next time as we ask the diagnostic question, are we or do we have a growing concern for the spiritual and temporal needs of others? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your presence. We thank you for your presence to the person of Jesus Christ who died on the cross for our sins and rose from the dead. Lord, I ask you every day, let us be aware of your presence. Let us seek out your presence in your word through talking to you in everyday life. Lord, let us look for you. Let us experience you. And let your presence encourage us to obey you and to live for you. Lord, remind us every day that you will never reveal yourself to us in a way that contradicts your word. So let us get in your word. Let us read your word. Let us meditate on your word. Thank you, Lord, for your blessings. Thank you for your presence. In your name we pray. Amen. All right. We'll see you next time.